Good morning. I'm Sherman Stanford, and this is Making Sense of the Chaos. And uh, a chaotic world, in fact, does exist out there. Trying to understand it, it should be a major focus for each of us. Uh, and, I, and I think that uh, everyone at least tries to understand that little corner of it. But if all you understand is your little corner of it and you don't have a broader view, then um, your view is going to be incomplete and you're going to make mistakes that are going to cost you and your loved ones in ways that you can't even imagine. So what I'm trying to do, uh, having lived a fairly long life uh, with an um, unusually high degree of curiosity, I have tried to understand things and fit them together and so what, what I'm doing is I'm trying to explain what I've seen from God's perspective, as well as my eyes and my understanding allow me to see. Uh, hopefully you'll agree. If you don't, tell me. I'll be glad to listen. In order to understand the world around us, there are a few facts that we need to bear in mind, and they're facts. I've been calling them principles, but they're really facts. First, God created the cosmos for his glory, not for man's. And he created it out of nothing, by the way. He didn't create it out of something that already existed, nor did he create it out of himself, a part of himself. It's entirely separate from him. He created it good, uh, <clears throat> but he created for his glory. The jewel of his creation is man. Um, third, although in no sense the author of evil, God as the creator of heaven and earth ordained Adam's fall. Fourth, in Adam the entire creation fell, including all of mankind. Fifth, as a result of the fall, God pronounced a curse of enmity, hostility, between the seed of the woman, Jesus Christ, who was to come, and all those who would be in him, who would spend eternity with God, and the seed of the serpent, Satan, uh, his demons, and the rest of humanity. This is known as the great antithesis. Sixth, all subsequent human social experience is an outworking of this antithesis. Seventh, the unregenerate those who do not bend the knee to God, to God are without excuse. They know God, but they suppress the truth about God in culpable self-deceit. As uh, Paul says, they exchange the truth of God for a lie. Today we're talking about, and this is the, uh, the last section of, uh, uh, the, the last of the first section of the book, there are five sections all together. Um, uh, uh, after today, we'll, we'll start talking tomorrow about uh, the history of the church from its inception through the 16th century. And if you are unaware of the significance of the 16th century and man's development, that probably indicates that you were educated in a public school in the last 30 years which is another way of saying that you were not educated well at all, that they failed to teach you most of the important things that you should have learned, but they probably made you feel pretty good about yourself because they thought that was most important. <clears throat> I think the, the only two uh, significant flaws in the public compulsory public education system, the first is it's compulsory, and the second is it's public, it's a government school. Other than that, I think they're perfectly fine. There isn't much else, though, is there? Anyway, <clears throat> that's a side note. Uh, after we, but what was important during the 16th century is the Protestant Reformation. And if you're a Protestant, you should know something about that. If you're a Roman Catholic, you should know something about that. Because it has, at least for Western 
culture, Western civilization, which um, is at least half of uh, the world. It is the defining moment of separation between two major uh, schools of thought that have had immeasurable uh, impact on the development of civilization from both schools. Uh, we're going to get into that. It's, uh, it's very important to understand. After that, we're going to talk about um, the end times eschatology because I think that what we think about where we're going determines our steps today and so we have to have a clear understanding of what the Bible talks about how things are going to end so we know what our role is today what is our mission today because that mission is going to be in terms of where we're going as a church where we're going as a world and the Bible tells us about that the next book is going to be about uh, Arminianism, which is, uh, and we've already touched on it, the idea that, that men, by their free will decisions, they trigger God's action in saving them. That they first act by choosing God, and then he grants them faith and regenerates them. Now, this is a major error. This is a, a seedbed of humanism, and humanism is uh, the, uh, the secular uh, um, threat as a thought system, an overall thought system to Christianity. And then the last section of the, of the entire book, we'll probably spend about six or seven weeks on that, maybe maybe 10 weeks, I don't know, it's, it'll take a while, uh, is I'll try to wrap all of this up into uh, a, a nice neat little bundle, talk about issues that are facing us today and how the things that we've discussed um, impinge on those issues, how they influence it and affect them. Uh, <clears throat> and hopefully at the end of that, you'll, you'll know more than I do, hopefully. At any rate, today we're talking about how do we distinguish between the saved and the lost? Because there is this huge antithesis, half of humanity uh, hates God and the other half loves him. That's not exactly half and half, but one huge division of humanity hates God and another loves him. How are they supposed to relate? How are we supposed to relate to both of them? Well, you know, we've been talking about that, but we have to identify as well as we can who belongs to what group so we can decide how we ought to treat them. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. I'm going to go over what we talked about yesterday and then we'll finish up. The first test in distinguishing between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman is their verbal professions. Those who openly express rebellion against God can be taken at their word. They hate him and they hate his seed. They are at the very least among those presently lost. Now you understand that all of the seed of the woman comes out of the seed of the serpent. Uh, you were born as a fallen creature. I was born as a fallen creature. If you are a believer in Christ today, then you were converted you were regenerated, you were granted the gift of faith and the gift of repentance at that point, at the point of your conversion. Um, and at that point, you moved from the seed of the serpent to the seed of the woman. So that's what we're having to decide for ourselves, is who belongs to which seed. Okay. <clears throat> if they say that they hate God, then we take them at their word. They are at the very least among those presently lost, and as such are proper objects for proselytizing, evangelizing, until they disqualify themselves by their determined rejection of God's gracious offer of salvation. Now it gets a little trickier in dividing the sheep from the goats among those who profess faith in Jesus. There are a lot of people who say they believe in Jesus, but you look at them and you look at their lives and you think, ah, oh, man, I wonder. So what are we supposed to do with them? Well, I think that initially, we're supposed to confer the benefit of the doubt on them and treat as saved all those who make a credible profession of faith. What does that mean? How credible should credible be? Well, um, first of all, I think 
the, the, uh, the standard ought to be pretty much the standard that we follow in a court of law in a criminal trial, uh, proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, if I were on a jury in a criminal trial and proofs had been offered that I thought probably indicated that the guy is guilty, but I thought there was still, there was still some doubt, not all the T's had been crossed, not all the I's had been dotted, then even though in my mind I thought the guy was probably guilty, I would have to decide in rendering a verdict that he's not guilty, that they have failed to prove that his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt because there still remains some reasonable doubts. Not that I think he's innocent, but I think that he could be innocent and that it's reasonable, a reasonable person could believe he did not commit the crime that he's charged with. Well, in the same way, when when we're going to decide that somebody who says he's a Christian is not a Christian, we have to have proof beyond a reasonable doubt. A single sinful action is certainly not proof beyond a reasonable doubt, because if it were, there would be no Christians. Paul the Apostle uh, said of himself that he was the chief of sinners, and that he didn't deserve to be an apostle, that he didn't deserve to be saved. Well, neither do I deserve to be saved, nor do you. And even after salvation, that we, we have all fallen off him. I mean, Paul in, in Romans 7 talks about struggling with the sin principle in his flesh. And he, and he says uh, that, uh, that he, he, he appeals to God to, to relieve him from this, his sinful temptations. Well, look, if we're going to judge somebody as not a Christian because they fall into a single sin or some sins, then no one's a Christian. So, so that can't be the standard. Now, if there's a pattern of sin in their lives, and if they don't make any effort to deal with the pattern of sin in their lives, and the pattern is a growing pattern, that is, sin is growing, at some point, we may have to decide that this person can't be treated as a Christian. But you may privately, just as we talked about in the case of uh, uh, the criminal on trial, you may privately believe that this person is probably not a Christian, but that doesn't mean that you should publicly treat him as if he's not a Christian. You have to still give him the benefit of the doubt, even though yourself, you in yourself, you privately don't believe he really is a Christian. You need to keep that to yourself because uh, that's something that you're not supposed to be judging unless the evidence is just clear. Now, that's kind of tough. Uh, since as human beings, I see that we got discontinued. Well, I'll just pick up right where we were. Uh, we're talking about judging. Anyway, since as human beings, we do not have omniscience and thus lack the power to infallibly read hearts, we are to bend over backward to think the best of those who profess faith in Jesus. But at some point, if the evidence overwhelmingly points to functional unbelief, or if a legitimate professing church has declared them outside the bounds of the faith based upon their proven actions, then we are to treat them as members of the seed of the serpent and no longer have fellowship with them. Okay? If, um, if there's a, a practicing church that's duly recognized and accepted as a Christian church who has dealt, has disciplined a sinner and dealt with them and has excommunicated them, has declared them outside the faith, then at, from that point on, I think that you are required to treat them as apostate, as no longer uh, Christian, and that you're no longer to have fellowship with them. Ceasing to maintain fellowship with those who have fallen away from the faith does not mean that we cut all ties with them. So what does fellowship mean? That's a, that's a subject that the Bible talks about but does not explain. And so I think you just have to try to figure that out on your own. Uh, but clearly, fellowship is something that you're supposed to do with fellow believers. Fellow believers, fellowship. And so the relationship that you have 
with unbelievers cannot be the same as the relationship that you have with believers. Right? At the very least, there are elements of trust that exist in your relationship with a fellow believer that you should not have with an unbeliever. How can you trust an unbeliever, someone who is an enemy of God and thus an enemy of yours if you're in Christ, how can you trust them with uh, eternal matters of eternal significance, consequence? Obviously, you can't. How can you treat them as if they are fellow Christians? How can you ask their advice, their counsel on fundamental issues in your life if you know they're going to be coming from a perspective other than God's perspective. And you know that. You know they're not going to be coming from God's perspective. Why? Well, because they've already rejected God. That's why they're unbelievers. This is pretty simple. Now, we should continue to love unbelievers and in every, every way that we can, short of treating them as fellow believers. Obviously, if we love them, we will desire that they return to the fold. But we can neither overlook their rebellion nor assail them for their unbelief each time we meet. Okay, there's a balancing act that we have to, that we have to do. We have to kind of walk down a tightrope. On the one hand, we can't be constantly taking our Bibles and pounding people over the heads with them. Can't do that. It isn't going to, to bring them to Christ it's going to alienate them from Christ and from you. Uh, now, does there come a time when you have to say, listen, this is what the Bible says about what you're doing? Well, certainly. And certainly that time is reached if they're asking you to join with them in behaving uh, in an unchrist-like way. What does that mean? Well, what, whatever. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're hanging around with people who are, who are viewing pornography and they want you to view pornography with them, well, obviously, you have to draw the line and say, I, I, can't, I can't be doing that. You know, if they're cussing and fussing all the time, you can't be cussing and fussing with them all the time. You can't act like them. You must always bring Christ into your relationships with everybody, including unbelievers. Well, isn't that going to be offensive? Well, of course it'll be offensive. You can't help that. Well, how offensive... Does it have to be? Well, that's up to them. Uh, now, if, it doesn't mean that you have to be a, a Miss Goody Two-Shoes, holier than thou, but it does mean that you have to avoid the things that the Bible says to avoid. I mean, you, you, you can't... I mean, if, uh, if you're a, a woman and you have female friends and they want to go cruise the bars and pick up men, well, obviously, you can't be doing that with them. Uh, if you're a guy, similarly, if your friends want to go cruise the bars and pick up women, you can't be doing that. I mean, there's just things you can't be doing. Uh, if, if they're using the Lord's name in vain, you can't join them in that. Do you have to tell them, please don't do that in my presence? Well, you, you have to decide that for yourself. Uh, I, I think it's very offensive to have to listen to that, and so for my my taste, yeah, I, I'd have to tell people, please don't, please don't do that. that that's offensive. Uh, but you decide that for yourself. Uh, the point is not that you have to tell them how they have to behave, but you have to make clear to them how you must behave, and then it's up to them to decide: do they want to behave, or do they want to respect your definitions for your own behavior or not? But you're not allowed to meet them on their grounds, hoping to establish friendship with them and then bring them to your grounds. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. If you meet them on their ground, Well, didn't Jesus eat with uh, sinners and tax collectors? Well, certainly he did. But he didn't engage in the sins with them. He, he went as an emissary of God, bringing holiness and righteousness to them. He did not go as one of them. And that's the distinction. And certainly... You want to be involved with the world. You can't possibly live a life where you will have no contact with unbelievers. Uh, as Paul says, you'd, you'd, have to, you'd have to live in another world. So arriving at the precise stance to take regarding the individual rebel can only be done after much prayer and careful consideration, remembering that the goal 
is to return the person to the bosom of the church, or in the case of someone who's never been a believer, to bring them to Christ, not to confirm them in their rebellion or drive them away. And the goal certainly is not to increase my or your smug self-righteousness because we're such good Christians. No, we don't, we don't want to go there. We're, first of all, we're not good Christians. <laughs> no. We're sinners saved by grace and uh, sustained by grace every day of our lives. And except for God's grace, I can tell you how long I'd last as a Christian. Um, not, not a minute. Not a minute. Toward the seed of the woman, those passing muster as believers, we're to love and have fellowship. So what does that mean? What does that love look like? Hmm. Our love should be broad enough and deep enough to accept and overlook their failings where possible without sinning ourselves and to admonish them gently or firmly as necessary when they clearly depart from God's standard. We should be prepared not only to offer emotional support to them, but also any other support they need that we can provide, including prayer, of course, the most powerful thing that we can give them, personal acceptance, and physical provision. Food, yes. Even money, where appropriate. Money. 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 Whew. Yes, money. Now, toward the outright seat of the serpent, those beyond the pale of believers, we are to love and evangelize, but not to have fellowship with them. The Bible is not specific about what constitutes fellowship, as we've talked about allowing each of us to use our judgment, but it appears to center around the issue of trust and the quality of acceptance of them as brothers in the narrow sense of fellow believers. We can't be going there. We may see them as brothers in the broadest sense, all bearing the image of God, but we must make an effective distinction between our relationships with believers and with unbelievers because we are obliged to keep in mind the great antithesis declared by God between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. In dealing with the seed of the serpent, we are also wise to be vigilant for their false dealings and their words and actions of enmity toward God and toward Christians. We must always be prepared to defend God and his truth, together with his elect, the, in the visible seed of the woman. You can't make common cause with unbelievers against God or against believers. You can't be doing that. Even believers who belong to different denominations from you, who believe things somewhat differently from you, as long as you're to give them the benefit of the doubt as Christians, then you are to defend their essential Christianity to the world of unbelievers. You can't, you can't appear to be in league with unbelievers and attacking believers. That's just, can't be doing that. And I've done that to my regret and chagrin. And God has uh, forgiven me because he's a, he's a forgiving God. But I need to remain on guard against doing that. But we must seek God's wisdom in determining the vigor, tone, and method of defense. Because the ultimate purpose of defending God and his seed is not to win, but to glorify God, the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 3.15 says we are to defend the faith, quote, with gentleness and respect, end quote. Making that our focus will enable us to demonstrate Christ in the world, not seek to win an argument. And listen, I'm a very competitive person. So it's really, really tough for me to discuss issues and not have it degenerate into me versus you, me versus him, and I want to win. Uh, it's hard to remember, but I must strive constantly to remember that it's not about me winning, it's not about me, me losing, it's about me being faithful to God and presenting his truth in as winsome a way as I can whatever that means. I suspect I'm not terribly winsome, but that's still my goal. Making that our focus will enable us to demonstrate Christ in the world, not seek to win an argument. And hopefully, 
in doing so, in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, souls will be one for Christ. In short, while Christians are required to love their neighbor, including unbelievers, as themselves, that means they are to act lovingly by keeping God's commandments in all their dealings with unbelievers. They are not required to feel the emotion we identify as love. Okay. Loving somebody doesn't mean that you feel uh, you know, sentimental or you know, mushy, ooshy, ooey gooey toward him. It means that you act a certain way. How we act toward unbelievers is important. How we feel toward them is largely irrelevant. But what, is, what does Paul tell us about how to act? How to act toward unbelievers? Well, let's take a look at that. There just happens to be a chapter in which he addresses that very issue. It's in 1 Corinthians at chapter 13. This is a beautiful, beautiful chapter, but it also has some uh, admonitions of how we are to behave that are just entirely <laughs> too hard. <laughs> I mean, you take, take your Bible, read it with me, um, and see if you're able to do the things that he says we are to do if we're going to love anybody. He starts off saying, If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, which of course he's talking to me now. And if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Wow. That's pretty hard. Now he gets into the meat of it. Love is patient and kind. Am I always patient and kind? Mm, kind of. <laughs> no. Are you? Love does not envy or boast. Ooh. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Now that is a lot. That is our mission. That's what we're charged to do. We're not sitting here on earth waiting to die and go to heaven. Rather, we're citizens of heaven, and as citizens of heaven, we bring heaven and its principles on earth as colonists. We colonize the earth for God from heaven. Heaven is not a place so much as it's a way of being, a way of thinking, and we bring that way of thinking to the earth looking forward to not only um, the end of our earthly difficulties, but to a resurrected life in the consummation after the judgment day. And so our job is to bring heaven on earth. So let us wrap it all up. As Christians, we are in one sense the bride of Christ. Okay? And in another sense, we're the living personification of the hero who slays the dragon, the seed of Satan. The hero, of course, is Jesus. And we're the living on earth today personification of Jesus. As the bride, we enjoy fellowship with Jesus and with fellow believers. 
as members of Jesus' body, we are the hero who kills unbelievers by helping to put to death the old creature who is then miraculously transformed into newness of spiritual life and granted faith in God by his grace through the outworking of his spirit, adding to the number of the saved daily. We do so both by speaking the words of life to all who will hear and by living lives faithful to God and his word as we extend love to the lost. That's our mission. I thank you for your time and your attention. And uh, tomorrow, as I said, we will begin talking about the history of the church. I hope God uh, blesses you today and uh, keeps you safe. But remember, the worst thing in the world is not dying. It's living in unfaithfulness. Thank you. God bless you.